And it is. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's all about Jesus, and sometimes it's so easy to make it about everything else. It's good to see you this morning. Happy July 4th weekend. Hope you had some time off. Didn't shoot your fireworks off in your face or anything like that. Straighten up. <laughs> it's always somebody else, isn't it? Dennis, this is two churches for you, I mean, in one day. Two campuses, and you get paid twice as much whatever they paid you last week. <laughs> see, two times zero. <laughs> hey, it is good to see you. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Praise the Lord. You know, we're in our series of messages having to do with the miracles of Jesus, and our, our computer's been going a little crazy today, so if it can't pull it up, we'll just do it without all those fun notes and stuff. I, I don't see the little wackadoo anyway up here. Somebody leave it back there. Uh, if you get it working, well, praise God. I tell you what, let's just save us both the time and trouble and forget it. <laughs> Amen. But uh, as long, long as you can see me. <laughs> Bless your hearts. Hey, hey, I'm just kidding. Get over it, all right? Praise the Lord. So here's the old school style. Since I'm not going to have the scripture up on the screen, I want you to do something very hard and open your Bibles. Oh, man. Starting in the fall, I think I'm going to take all the scriptures off. We're going to try to redo some of the lighting so you can have more light out there in the worship center and you can read the scriptures as well. But is it actually working? You give these guys a hand. Praise the Lord. Way to go. Well, hold off. Don't give him too big a hand. Let's see if it works. <laughs> All right. We're in this series of messages on the miracles of Jesus, and we're getting to the end of the series. In fact, we've tried to be very chronological, for the most part, in the order of these, these miracles as they take place. Kind of gives us an insight into the ministry of Jesus as we've walked through them. And we see how these miracles play such an important part. Number one is the signs that they provide that Jesus is who he says he is. He's the Lord. He's the Messiah, so, you know, we get that, the insight there to how each one is a, is a testimony of that fact. But also there's this, we see the practical implications for the disciples. He is in the process of discipling them. That's why we call them disciples, all right? So they're going through this process of understanding and learning and being taught and growing. And, and uh, now they're starting to get the whole big picture of what's going on to some degree. But as we look at it each week... Uh, we're moving closer and closer to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. And we're about a week out when you get into Luke chapter 18 uh, and you start looking at the story of blind Bartimaeus. There's a really important uh, message in all of this that we'll see uh, for us. But even more specifically, this blind man relates so much to where the nation was. Jesus has been with him almost three complete years. And miracle after miracle giving a, a, you know, the testimony of the fact that he is the Messiah that they have long waited for. He is the Lord. And uh, it's interesting that this, these last miracles, I mean, this is the time when you see Zacchaeus and goes to eat with him. This chapter also has Bartimaeus, but he's the blind man, representing a lot of how the nation of Israel was so blind and rejecting the master who had come to, to be the Christ and to be the Lord for them. And uh, they don't seem to quite get the message. So as we look at this passage in verses 35 through 43, and Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was, was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. He kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy upon me. And Jesus stopped and, and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. So as we see these people responding, the crowds really become fickle as we're getting to this part in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, the, in fact, they're getting smaller wherever he goes as well. Now, there are three accounts of this story in, in Scripture. There's, there's, there's an account of it found in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. So we, Mark and Luke say there's only one blind man. Uh, Luke was not necessarily an eyewitness to the incident. He's just relating as the Holy Spirit's given the, 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 the Scriptures to him, and he's writing them down. Some say there were many blind beggars. This 
just one incident. Matthew says there were two men there. Uh, one says it was when Jesus is entering. Another gospel says when he's leaving. We really don't know all the facts concerning this, but I really don't believe the Bible has discrepancies. If there's a discrepancy, it's usually on our understanding of what's going on. In fact, there were two Jerichos. There was old Jericho and new Jericho. So he could be leaving one and entering the other in any way. We, I believe if we knew all the facts, I'm certain we, they'd all line up just perfectly. But Mark does name, and we also have the scriptures make very clear that he is the blind man. But Mark names him as Bartimaeus. <coughs> Excuse me. So Bartimaeus is the, literally the terminology just means uh, son of Timaeus. But one more thing we see out of this, we see the message of, of Jesus and what he's been teaching. Uh, the message of Jesus, what he's been teaching, is that he, he didn't come to the world to be ministered to, but to minister to others. And uh, what, what I want you to catch today is the important thing about this man. He so much represents the nation of Israel, but he also represents us as well. In fact, I broke this thing down into three points. Of course, I have a million and 42 sub points, you know me. But it was the man, first of all, who needed. And then we'll look the second point was the man who pleaded. And the third point is the man who succeeded. Uh, we don't succeed if we don't do it, follow pretty much the same scenario in our own walk, in our own life as he did. But Martimaeus is an interesting character. He is the man who needed. In fact, the scriptures refer to him, the ancient manuscripts don't refer to him as a blind man. It's a very specific uh, word identifying him as the blind man. Now, what that means, I, I am not sure, but apparently because of that interpretation, or at least that, that rendering in the original manuscripts as the, the people of Jericho obviously knew who he was or knew something about him. It just refers to him as, as though he's kind of well known. He's the blind man out there. You know, it's, it's the guy who's there all the time, the blind man. And we know that if we read the story, he hears the crowd coming and obviously being blind, he can't see, but he calls out once he heard who was coming. In fact, faith comes by hearing anyway, not by seeing, doesn't it? He hears, and obviously I think there's this overriding tone. The ministry of Jesus has been going on three years. He knows something about Jesus. He's obviously heard the stories and paid very close attention to how he's healed people, how he's cured people who are extremely sick, cast out demons, how he's made the blind to see, how he's even raised the dead. So when he hears that that Jesus that he's heard so much about is coming, He's going to do everything he can to get his attention because he wants to meet this one and have at least the opportunity. In fact, being one week away from the crucifixion, if he doesn't meet him now in this kind of format, he's not going to meet him in another format. Now, the second click on all these isn't happening, so I'm going to let you just click it automatically. There. He's, now, he said, first of all, he's the man who needed. He's also the man who played it. Don't back up when we go ahead back to where we were. All right as the man who, who not just had a need in his life, but he also pleaded. So what's he pleading? Have mercy on me. Says he began to cry out. Now, you know, I don't think we have to exaggerate much here. Here's a guy, we don't know how long he's been this way. He's, he's born with sight because he's asking for his sight to be regained. But I don't think he's saying, Jesus, could you pay attention to me? Uh, yeah, I'm blind over here in the corner. And if you get a chance, you know, maybe you can work up a little extra time. No, I said, he's crying out, Lord, son of David, have, have mercy on me. Because he began to, Lord, that I might receive my sight. He's very specific, he's very clear when he, when he comes before the Lord. Now, let me, let me give you a couple of points here as we go through this. First of all, he didn't complain to the Lord. If you want to know something about crying out to the Lord and speaking to the Lord, it's best not to approach the Lord with complaints. In fact, the Bible says we enter his courts with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise, not with complaints. A lot of people, that's pretty much when they do pray, it's kind of like they go to the Lord and they just kind of go in there with, with, with not real, real humility, but just kind of with a complaining heart. Well, why me, Lord? Why is all this? Why do I have to experience this? Why? And it goes on like that. I don't believe there's any real problem with asking the Lord why, but that's a little different from saying, why me? All right. There's kind of a sense of uh, selfishness and self-centeredness and self-pity in there. And I think if you really want to get the Lord's attention, I think it's better to approach it with an act and an attitude and a heart that humbles itself before God and says, Lord, why? There's lots of times I've asked the Lord why. There's lots of times I haven't got the answer back, but I do not and, and am not afraid of asking the Lord to tell me why. The second thing is, once you hit that for me, is that he called out to 
the Lord, all right? In fact, when he calls out to the Lord in these verses, a couple of verses where it says he's crawling out to him, he refers to him as the son of David, and then refers to him specifically, he refers to him as Lord. So he's recognizing the deity of Christ, all right, as well as humanity. He's recognizing that he's Messiah by calling him the son of David. That was a, what we call a messianic title. So he's, he has faith that this is the one who's supposed to come, that God's going to send the Savior and the Deliverer, but he also has faith enough to believe that he's the Lord, he's the master. Whether he's heard all the stories about the wind and the waves and the water walking, we don't know, probably has. I mean, the fame of Jesus is pretty much spread throughout the, line, the land. But he's calling upon the Messiah. And this is important to catch here. Because any decent Jewish Hebrew person in this time who was looking for the coming Messiah also knew those promises surrounding of who, what Messiah would do for the people. And in Scripture, in Isaiah 29, it says, On that day the deaf will hear the words of a book, and out of the gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. Another prophetic passage in Isaiah 35 says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. So he has faith at this point to call out on the one who is the Messiah to do what prophecy said that the Messiah would do for him. Open my eyes. So we see here, this guy's not ignorant. He's blind, all right? But he's not mentally and spiritually blind. His eyes are open enough to believe what the prophet said about Messiah. He believes he is Messiah, and he believes he can do what Messiah is supposed to do. So we see in his appeal that he's calling out. He's not complaining, though he was at this point corrected by the masses. And by the way, please understand, it's the outcast like him that got the attention of Jesus. It's the outcast like Zacchaeus in this chapter who got the attention of Jesus. Sometimes we feel in ourselves that we might not be important enough or maybe we've failed too much or we've gone too far or we've sinned too much or we've made too big a mistake in our life. We've sinned too greatly that we're not gonna really get God's attention. The whole of this message and the whole of the ministry of Jesus comes up with a summation of this. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Jesus Christ came in the world. Not just to save sinners, but also to be a servant and to minister to those, not to be ministered unto. And here's a guy who obviously needs ministry. Now, as he's corrected, you know, some people might say, well, you know, why are they corrected him? Well, and you can hit these little clicks for me right quick if you want. But some thought he was just being in, too intrusive, I'm sure. You know, he, he got to be polite. And I believe then there were some who thought it was just beneath the dignity of Messiah, the Son of God, to respond to this, the blind man. All right. He hadn't got time for the blind man. And then there were the religious leaders who just couldn't bear to hear those words that honored Jesus as Lord and especially as Messiah because they didn't believe it. Then there was the crowd. You know, on the other hand, there were many of them who were becoming very fickle and they, it was kind of bitter for them to have once kind of believed and now they're stepping back to hear those words that Jesus is the Lord or that Jesus is the Messiah. So they're not really intent on hearing it. But on the other hand, He's obviously committed to getting the attention of the Lord. He's crying out. And it's not once. It's multiple times. The idea is he keeps crying out, Lord Messiah, Lord Messiah, save me, help me, deliver me. He, you know, he, he, he's going to make sure that he gets the attention of the Lord. And he's not going to be satisfied with not getting the attention of the Lord. So he's committed to getting the attention of the Lord. So he's the man who needed. He's the man who pleaded. The third thing here we see about him, he's the man who succeeded. In fact, Mark 10 said he laid aside his garment. This is the outerwear, the protective outerwear that, 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 that he would wear. And this, this is important here because you see this not only happening here with this man, you see it happening with many people who are calling on the Lord in humility and seeking God's help and God's, you know, God's aid. It represents pretty much himself. You see, I, I really don't believe we get the attention of the Lord if we're just approaching the Lord, trying to maintain our, our dignity and maintaining our, our self-esteem and, you know, kind of trying to be important or trying to be gathered or collected or cool or whatever the terminology that you might embrace would be. The idea here is, is humility. I mean, we're just, I, I, I'm through with that now. I'm through with who I am. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. 
It's the same kind of picture you get of King Jehoshaphat when the, the enemies of God are surrounding the nation and he stands up after hearing the news that we are, we're surrounded, we're doomed. He cast off his garment. For those who were here on Wednesday night for our Jonah study, you remember we did the story on, on the, the, the chapter on Nineveh and how the king of Nineveh, when he heard the word of God, he cast off his garment and he threw it down. It's the idea that I am nothing, God is everything, I, I don't have the answer, I'm not sufficient, I can't handle this. Of course, that's the last words most people want to say, isn't it? We don't want to come to that place. But until we come to that place, we haven't even started, all right? So there's humility. When the king stands up and steps away from his throne, basically he's saying, you're in charge. I'm getting off the throne. We have to do that in our lives, in reality. We have to do that in our own hearts. Not only once, but I think it's a, it's a way of living our lives that we say, I, I'm not embracing my self-identity. I'm a new person in Christ. I belong to Jesus. I'm a child of God. I am one of his people, all right? And I'm now embracing that lifestyle. And so as he does this, he, you, this is where success really comes in. You know, he cast aside the garments and they represent sometimes our sins, sometimes our unrighteousness, our selfishness. And this is where success starts. You say, well, well how, 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 did he, how did he succeed? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first thing was, he, they brought him to Jesus. Well, earlier they're just denying him, they're pushing him aside. Now they bring him to Christ. In fact, when it uses this word in the, the context of the, of the Greek language, the idea here is it's the same word of bringing uh, uh, that they would use, to, use in, in a terminology of bringing someone that's sick or ill to meet the doctor or bring him to the hospital or to the, to the, to the physician. They bring him. In other words, they, 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 here's the man who needs a deliverance and they bring him to the deliverer. And the Lord says, what do you want? I want to regain my sight. Now there's a powerful lesson here, folks, if you'll get it, on being very specific when you pray. And I think it's important that we, we are aware, one, why should we be specific? Does God not know? No, he knows all things. We're specific because we need to know. And we don't always know. We think we know a lot of times, but we really don't know. And sometimes it's good for us to do a little inventory of our lives to say, oh, I do have some needs in my life. And there's some issues. So I'm not bowing my head by my bed at night saying, dear God, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul. No. Or saying, oh God, bless me. Bless my children. Bless my pastor. Bless my mama. Bless my daddy. Bless Aunt Nunu. Yeah. yeah, you say, well, that's the way I pray. I am sure that mom and dad and Aunt Nunu have some specific needs that you can pray for. Yes. All right? Well, Brother Joe, that takes time. <laughs> God forbid that we should have to spend some time in the greatest place in the cosmos, which is in the presence of God. Hey, it beats any place you've ever been. And it's important that we get specific and, you know, not that God again doesn't know that we need to hear ourselves saying, I am trusting God for these needs and for this situation in my life. So he's brought to the Lord and he asked specifically. And as the result of that, he's healed. And remember, it's not as great faith as it, it, that happens here. And when the Lord says your faith has made you whole, it's the object of his faith. And we talked about that last week, so I'm not going to go into that to any detail and say, hey, it's not how great your faith is. It's how great your Savior is. It's how great Messiah is. It's how great the Lord is. And he's calling on him in this regard. The third thing that shows he succeeded, he glorifies the Lord. He starts praising God. By the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. I'm sure that even when he starts praising the Lord and he's excited, you know he's excited. He's been blind. And he's praising God and he's leaping and rejoicing, thanking God, you know, for everything that's just taken place and what's happened in his life. I'm sure those who have thought, oh, that's just not necessary. He's just drawing attention to himself. <laughs> himself was the last thing on his mind. The fourth thing that shows how he succeeded says he followed the Lord. That's the most notable thing about this whole story. 
He followed the Lord. And so often when we go to the Lord and sometimes give our specific needs to the Lord and then we see God meet a specific need, we don't continue following the Lord. We got what we wanted. We're like the nine out of the ten lepers who came and were healed and only one comes back to give gratitude. And I think it's important that we not be so blind like, like Bartimaeus was and not see what God is up to and what God has done and how God is working in our life. I think the, the, the lessons are pretty simple here. One, we are blind. And let me give you a, a couple of scriptures. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, In whose case the God of this world blinds the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel uh, of the glory of Christ. Another King James says, see the light of the glorious gospel in the face of Christ. In other words, before you come to a genuine place of your life of really saying, God, you're my God now. Jesus, I, I trust you. I know I'm a sinner. I turn from my sins. And I trust you as my Lord and Savior. You know, until we come to that place to really acknowledge that we are needing, needing God, that we need a Savior, that we're lost and on our way to hell without Him, until we get to that place in our life, then we're just like what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4. We are blind. He wrote it again in Ephesians 4 when he talked about them being darkened in their understanding. That's being blind. Excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. So in these two verses, he gives us a clear picture of what it's like when we have not yet yielded our lives to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's so important. It's the most important thing you'll do in all of eternity, in all of your existence, is when you come to the place in your life and say, I can't save myself, and I'm making a, doing a lousy job of being God over my own life. And we surrender. And we say, Lord, you're, you're, you're in charge now. Save me from my sins. Forgive me from my sins. Deliver me. And God moves in that point in time. What happens? The blinders fall off. So how can I know if the blinders are off? Well, you can tell when the blinders are off because you begin to see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Amen. King James said, you see the glorious gospel, the glorious Savior. In other words, this whole thing about God and Jesus and the Bible and the Christian becomes real. And it's exciting. And let me use the word it uses in the King James. It's glorious. glorious. It's glorious. It's, you know, I'm, it's exciting to be saved. And some of you act you know, like you're waiting for the funeral to start. You know, it's, it's, there's this thrilling part of no, I know God. I know I am secure. I know I'm not going to die and go to hell. That's some pretty good news. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You can't, you can't beat that kind of news. Now, but to catch this, that's B.C., all right, in your life, before Christ. But even... After that moment, when you come to the place and you say, I need to give my heart and life to Jesus, you know, there's that passage in Revelation that as Christians it's possible to get to that place where we're needing the blinders taken off again. Paul, uh, the, the Lord Jesus speaks to the church, to the Apostle John. He says, I, I, you say, the church was saying, I am rich, I become wealthy, I have need of nothing. And you don't know that you're wretched and you're miserable and you're poor and you're blind and you're naked. Now, here's what they say. Here's what God says. And, and you really have to come to and approach it like this. What do I say about my spiritual life? Well, I'm just blessed and super blessed and things couldn't be any better. And praise God, I'm wonderful. And that may all be well true maybe at some point. But it could well be true at the same time that you've just kind of cloaked everything with religiosity and you're pretty good church member, but your heart is far from the Lord and your commitment to Christ is not what it used to be and your love for Jesus is not where it used to be and you become hardened in your heart. And like the church, you know, here in, in Scripture that he's rebuking, this church had just kind of, you know, well, we've succeeded. You know, we have, we have nice buildings and bodies to fill them and money in the offering plates and we've got everything just looking good. We have measured success by all the wrong standards. Because the world and the system of the world and the prosperity of the world and the wealth of the world is not the way you measure success. The standard for measurement is Jesus himself. Where do I stand with him? Where's my relationship? Am I right with him? Is my heart right with him? Or have I started allowing things in my life that I said I wouldn't do again? Started going directions and behaving in ways I said I wasn't going to do again. And now I find myself as poor and blind and naked and miserable and wretched. Those are pretty hard words. Don't get mad at me. They're in the Bible. He wrote them. Right. Amen. Amen. But this is the description. And Jesus is saying this to the church. 
And you say, well, that's not very nice of Jesus. <laughs> I always love to hear people say, wouldn't it just be nice if Jesus could come to church and preach this Sunday? <laughs> Woo, you thought I could be tough. You whip open the Bible to where Jesus is sermons to the religious folks. You blind leaders of the blind, you wretched, you miserable, you, you just like a bunch of whited sepulchers. You paint the grave white outside, but inside it's full of dead man's bones. You're like a bunch of snakes. <laughs> so maybe we don't want Jesus this Sunday. <laughs> we'll have Pastor Joe instead. But this is the truth. He's just laying it out. What we see sometimes is not the truth. And why do we not see things correctly? Because we're blinded. We're, we're blinded. We're not seeing correctly. Say, so what are we to do? And I think you say, well, that's not me. I think it is revealed in a lot of ways. Ways number one is we just don't see where we're going. You know, we just don't really see where we're headed and, and where we are in our life because we've had these blinders on. The Bible says in 1 John 2, gives us a little illustration. The one who hates his brothers in darkness. You know, it says he loves God, but yet he doesn't love his brother. I say I love God, but I can't forgive you. I say I love God, but I can't just get over the offense. I'm not going to give it up. I'm not going to lay it down. I'm not going to forgive you. The Bible says that you're in darkness then. Why are you in darkness? Because you can't see how much God's forgiven you. And you, God's been forgiving you of so many things and many times over. But yet you would still think you're better than somebody else or that you can't grant forgiveness to somebody else. He says you're just walking in darkness. In other ways, we, we, we're blinded and we, just, we get in the way of others. When our lives really aren't right with God, then we're a bad stumbling block. Luke 6, 39, Jesus said, a blind man can't guide a blind man. They're both going to fall in the ditch. When our lives are not right and we're professing that they are right, it means that we're walking in darkness like 1 John says, and we're blind. And we're not only messing our life up, we're messing other people's lives up by our blindness. How else? I think this is one of the most significant. We miss all the beauty and all the light and all that gloriousness of, of, of walking in light because we're walking in the darkness. John 8, Jesus said it again to them and he spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world, but he who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but they will have the light of life. This again in 1 John, he says the same thing. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with Christ. His blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You know, how do I know I'm walking in light? I'm fellowshipping with Christ. Well, Brother Joe, I'm walking in light, but I'm not really fellowshipping with the Lord because, you know, I've got this stuff in my life and I don't want to give it up. Then you're not walking in light. The next verse in 1 John says that you lie and you do not do the truth. Not only is you saying a lie, you live in lies, is what it says. So we have to come to the place to get honest with God because if I'm not, then I'm just missing everything that God wants to do. The last illustration of this is found from an illustration that I gave you last week where, where it talked about Elisha and his servant, you know, when they were at Dothan and the kings had sent out a word to capture them, bring them back prisoners and they were surrounded by the, by the enemy and the servants freaking out, we're dead, we're doomed, we're just over now, there's no way we're going to survive this and Elisha simply praised Lord, open his eyes. And when his eyes were open, he saw the angelic host, remember, around about them. His eyes got open. I think many times we, 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 we want to open the eyes of our, our, our heart and the eyes of our faith. And one of the greater evidences of it is that we're just, you know, we're, we're just fearful. We're doubting. Everything's negative. We're not going to get through this. We're not going to make it. It's not going to work. It's not going to happen. On and on it goes. It's just another evidence that we're not trusting God. It's another evidence that we're not walking in the light. It's another evidence that we're not believing God. So you see, it's real easy to be like Bartimaeus. And the way to get out of that, to move from the, to, to the place where we are succeeded, is to get to the place where we see the needs. And then we move forward with pleading to the Lord and asking God and seeking God's grace, asking Him to forgive us, asking Him to remove the blinders. If we miss that, then we'll walk around in darkness. The apostle Peter said, you know, it's possible that you can start drifting so far from the Lord that you forget what you used to be and you start moving back towards it. That we become blind and short-sighted and can't see what manner of man we used to be. And instead of running the other direction... We're moving back in the wrong direction toward what we used to be. Blind. The tragedy is, we're not like Bartimaeus. We're not recognizing the needs. It would do well for us probably often to pray, Lord, open my eyes. Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, one of the longest prayers in the New Testament, when he said, Lord, I pray that the eyes of their understanding might be open. 
the eyes of their mind, the eyes of their heart might be open, that they might see what the depth is and what the breadth is and what the height is of the inheritance that they have and who they are basically. They might understand who they are in Christ Jesus. And so many people don't. They just play church and go through the motions and never recognize Christ in their life or the glory of God in their life or see the presence of God in their life. It's like we were talking on the way over here from the other campus this morning. There's a difference, you know. We have these, we think, are coincidences in our life when really God's just doing all these God incidences in our life. And when we start walking with God, we start looking at things from a different perspective. We don't look at it from the world looking up. We start seeing things from God's perspective. And then we start understanding what the Bible says, what it says is all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to His purpose. We're not living in the doubts and why is this happening to me and why am I experiencing this and why didn't this work out and why? We start believing God. We start hearing from God and we start seeing. The Bible says, you know, the Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I don't believe that just means when we get to heaven. I believe it means now. And I, I think we might say it in the context of the present life. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall perceive God. Can you perceive God in anything going on in your life? Don't miss what he's doing by being blind. Would you stand with your heads bowed this morning? Could well be today you've never given your life to Christ. and you. Fit